Um, my name is Christopher Rees. I'm a partner in the Corporate Technology Group here at Taylor Wessing, uh, which is the mothership, if you like, for the uh, space law practice of the firm. Uh, we've uh, had a, a great selection of tools, um, as those of you who have been here all day will know. Uh, but I suspect this will be even uh, the most exciting because it deals with, oh, yes. as President Kennedy said, the new frontier, space. And it's about um, engaging with worlds other than our own for the, uh, uh, for the future. And we have got uh, two of the most distinguished members uh, of the British uh, space community here to talk to us about the particular applications that uh, their own businesses um, use to enable the, um, the new um, uh, venture. Uh, we're going to be uh, hearing first from uh, Dr. Matt Perkins. And um, Matt is the Chief Executive Officer of Surrey Satellite Technology, uh, which is uh, the leading provider of satellite missions, uh, um, small satellite missions uh, worldwide. So it's a real jewel of um, British uh, engineering and industry. And uh, Matt is also the chair of the UK Trade Association for the space industry. So we have um, a genuine expert to address you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, he will talk you through the intricacies uh, of nanosats. So, Matt. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. This is the first time I have spoken in a session on digital currency and seen fewer people in the room for the space session. <laughs> <laughs> However, there's a bit of a change of pace, hopefully. Now it's time for you all to start looking upwards. Gaze to the heavens. That's what we're here about today. Nanosats are one of the big topics that are being discussed throughout the space sector at the moment. The real question is, are they any use for anything? What can they do for us? So hopefully I can give you a flavour of what that is this afternoon. So, anyone built a nanosat? Hands up. Ah, oh, well done. <laughs> what is a nanosat? There is a definition, generally defined by mass, 1 to 10 kilograms. However, there is always the exception that proves the rule. So, over NASA Ames, a research centre in America, they consider them 1 to 50 kilograms because everything's bigger in America. <laughs> um, we'll stick with the 1 to 10 kilo mass range. Example of what they look like. A lot of, hopefully, a lot of you have heard about CubeSats. CubeSats is a, it's a somewhat flexible open standard. Uh, they're usually 10 centimetre cube satellites. They weigh about maximum of 1.3 kilos each. You can combine them together to make three U cube sats. Here's two examples, both British made. The one at the top is called U cube one. The first Scottish NANSAT to be launched. It was launched earlier this year, so it's been all bit now. The one below is called Strand One. That one was made by SSTL and it was launched last year, so we're the first British uh, NANSAT to have been launched. And so not, that wasn't the first one that's been launched. NANSATs as a term came into being about 2004, um, and it refers, as we said, to, to the mass of the spacecraft. Back in 2000, we built this. It was an internally funded project. It was called SNAP-1. Its job was to prove that you could put very low-cost digital cameras into space, take pictures with them, and that you could move a satellite into the location or towards the location of another satellite and take an image of it. So you can see the hardware down in the bottom left. That's one of the researchers at the University of Surrey who worked on it. Completely internally funded. It was launched. It took two pictures. The top one is a Russian navigation satellite that it was launched with. The bottom one is a Chinese satellite, which is also on the same launcher. And just to prove that so the pictures don't look great, but remember, this is digital technology back in 2000 in a vacuum that it wasn't designed to work in under radiation conditions that it had never experienced before and it took pictures. The satellites it's taking pictures of, there's the artist's impression of the Russian one. The Russians were horrified to find out that we could do this, especially when it was taking a picture of their satellite. And then on the picture below, you can see Snap-1, which weighs six kilos, so it is absolutely an Amazon. 
and Tsinghua, which we also built. We built for a customer in China at the time. It was launched on the same rocket and we took the trophy when it was released. Things have moved on. That was 14 years ago. Today, much more, or actually last year, much more interesting. Why don't we put a mobile phone in talk? A mobile phone has all of the electronic components that you would pretty much need to control and operate a satellite. It has computers, it has storage devices, it has cameras you can take pictures, it has gyroscopes you can determine what uh, orientation it's sitting in, it's got communication links so you can communicate with it, receive information back from it. Um, the reason we did it was we needed our new young engineers to work with the University of Surrey Research Centre to come up with some smart ideas on what technologies we'll use in the future. In SSTL, we use commercial off-the-shelf technology, to, and we put it into space, and it's taken us 30 years to, to make sure we understand the best way of configuring those terrestrial components to work up in orbit. That's the key skill that we can do. So that's what the broken down satellite looks like. It looks like something you can make on your kitchen table. But it is a satellite. It has all the components you need. When it's built up, here it is. Interesting thing to note is the wings. It's got wings. It's not because there's atmosphere where it's going. That's to make sure we can get more power and we'll come back to that. And then the picture on the right is that tiny little blue box in front of the two people. That's where it's launched out of. The rocket is enormous. Absolutely enormous, but our little satellite launched out of that little blue box into orbit. It's got a number of apps on it that we're going to prove work. So one of them, uh, some school kids asked, can, can you hear yourself scream in space? So we're going to play people screaming out of the loudspeaker on the phone and use the microphone on the phone to see if they can hear it. And the answer, of course, is no, you won't be able to hear it, but we'll be able to demonstrate it for school kids. But every, one of, every person in SSGL has got their picture on that phone, and it, they will be displayed in space, and there's another camera pointed at the screen which will take a picture and send it back down to Earth to prove that we have been up in space. Those are the sort of cool things we get to do playing around with space. There is a real serious reason for why we do these things, though. Ultimately, they can be useful. We're starting now to see commercial applications for nanosats. Earth Observation, a company, company called Planet Labs in America, raised $112 million to build a fleet of 28 of these satellites. Some have been launched and they, will take, they, they have optical cameras on them. They will take images of the Earth and they will provide that data on a commercial basis. There's a wide range of different remote sensing activities that you can do. Anything that you need information on a global or continental scale, space is a great environment to collect it from. It's an awful lot cheaper than flying aeroplanes. Especially if you want to see what's happening out in the middle of the ocean. Really, really useful because they're always orbiting the Earth. You can always switch them on, you can always collect data. And there's a, there's a um, European company called ISIS which is looking at how can you take advantage of um, nanosats to track aircraft in flight. So obviously the, the recent issue with the Malaysian aeroplane is a solution that could be offered which will make sure you can see them because constellations of satellites are always there and they're flying over the most remote areas of the planet. So you will always be able to see them. Constellations of nanosatellites is a real opportunity for the future. Science instruments. We all know about the Hubble telescope, don't we? Yes. Yeah. Oh good! <laughs> The James Webb Space Telescope, it's enormous. It is just about the biggest thing you can get onto a rocket to do astronomy from orbit. And it's hugely complicated to be able to fold the mirror out to get to the size it needs to be. And it's cost multi-billions of dollars and it's years late. We actually have some hardware on there as well. So we are doing world-leading research work on the, on the James Webb Space Telescope. Alternative approaches are to use nanosatellites and use them in formation flying techniques, bring them closer together, create a mirror surface, image where you want to, adjust the mirror surface, adapt the optics. You can point outwards and do strong astronomical observations, you can point them at the planet and do remote sensing applications. There's a, a research contract going on between JPL, Caltech in the USA and Surrey, University of Surrey at the moment to determine how exactly we put this sort of capability into orbit. The intention is to launch something to demonstrate it in 2016. 
So it's not something that's 20 years away. We already know how to do the formation flying. We already know how to do the, uh, the mirror surfaces. Lots and lots of the technology that's needed to do this is already available. They are fantastic as demonstration missions. If you want to space qualify a component to that, to put into orbit, if you take the traditional approach, it will cost you huge amounts of money and take forever. Cost of a typical CubeSat, maybe £100,000. Launch it as well, maybe another £150,000. Space qualified the second it's up there and it starts working. That's much cheaper than doing it the traditional way. And that's exactly the approach that SSTL has adopted over many years. As long as you have a rapid pace of launches, more than one a year, you can qualify new technology every time you launch something. They're fantastic for education and training. Teaching students at universities, getting them to build real space hardware, getting those to go up into orbit, and they see the fruits of their labor immediately. They find out the really hard way whether their way of working, their design principles, and their manufacturing techniques are effective. A lot of small sats, a lot of nanosats fail at the moment. That's because so many new people are building them and haven't yet learned the techniques needed to be able to uh, make things work out in orbit. But there are limitations. Power, power, and power. So you saw the previous um, nanosatellites, they had wings on for the solar arrays. The thing that you're most short on, on any sat on any um, CubeSat is power. And the power is the thing that makes the, the uh, satellite capable. So you need better, more power generation from the solar, you need better power storage, denser power storage, so you can fit more on there. Communication data rates are dependent on the amount of power you can put into your transmitter. So you need more power to get higher data rates so that you can get more data down onto the ground. And at the moment, because of the limitations of power, most of the payloads tend to be passive. So they can't transmit a signal and, and process the reflection. They have to wait for a signal to come to it and just receive it passively and then take advantage of it. So to make nanosatellites more useful, we need to get more power. We need to make sure we can point them in the right direction. No point taking pictures if the pictures are, are of the wrong places, and that you'd be surprised how often that happens. So getting the techniques miniaturized so that you can control the attitude of the spacecraft, make sure it's pointing in the right direction, make sure it's stable. Propulsion. Most of these nanosatellites are launched quite low, so below the International Space Station, which is about 400 kilometers, 450 kilometers above the Earth's surface. That means they'll re-enter quickly. So there won't be a space debris problem, because a few days after you've launched them, they'll re-enter the atmosphere and burn up. Having propulsion will allow you to keep them in that orbit for longer, and therefore get more data from them and more value from them. Reliability. Last year, 92 nanosats were launched. Somewhere in the region of 40% of them failed. And the failures were almost entirely down to people who were building them for the first time. So the ability to learn the techniques needed for manufacturing, the quality of soldering required, the selection of component, the use in that environment is a, le is a learning curve that everyone's going through. It's going to change though. Over the, between now and 2020, somewhere in the region of 2,500 nanosats are going to be launched. So just because we're getting failures at the moment, that's a normal learning curve. We've got to get through that learning curve so you can get real value from it. So 2020, what will we be doing? Two and a half thousand nanosats. <coughs> the trend is that they're going to be six kilos rather than three kilos. You'll get more power storage, you'll get more solar arrays, you'll get uh, more capacity for putting a payload onto a six kilo spacecraft than a three kilo spacecraft. Regular imaging of the Earth landmass. Today, my company can build you a constellation of small satellites <coughs> that could capture images of the whole of the land surface on the Earth every day. It'd be refreshed every single day for you. That's a very low cost. With swarms of nanosats, it'll be even cheaper to do. The question is, can you get the amount of data that will be generated in that process stored long enough to be able to get it back down to the Earth? We can take advantage of things like satellite systems already in orbit, the <coughs> GPS system, the GLONASS system for navigation. Signals from that bounce off the ocean surface. We can use that to tell us the state of the ocean surface. A constellation of satellites with that receiver on will allow you to assess the state of the ocean surface over the whole planet 
with a refresh time of somewhere in the region of two hours, which will be extremely useful for any shipping activities or weather monitoring. Again, so the, uh, the receivers needed to do that will fit quite easily on an cycle. Reconfigurable optical systems. Make them more flexible, make them more useful. New applications will be, will be identified which will take advantage of that flexibility. And tracking aircraft from space. We can already track ships from space. That's, there's, there's already a system, AIS, which does that for us. Aircraft is the next challenge. They move a little bit faster than ships, but we can still do it. But that's nanosatellites, that's what they can do for us, and hopefully that's what they will be doing for us in the next six years. Thank you very much.